All right, guys, here's the beginning of chapter three, uh, unit one on chemical bonding. Um, on the first page of the notes, you'll see here is a bit of an overview and study guide. Uh, you can just sort of take a look at that one as you kind of go through it and uh, look at the progression. I know it doesn't make sense yet, but it's something to look at as you kind of go through the unit and definitely something to look at as you prepare for the unit exam uh, at the end of the chapter. Key terms that you should know, that's pretty self-explanatory. If you want to start making yourself a bit of a vocab list just to know what these words mean, it just makes learning the concepts so much easier. All right, so that's all that's happening here on the first page. Just make sure you take a look at some of that. So getting into this one, we're looking at chapter uh, 3.1. And we're taking a look at bonding theory and something known as Lewis formulas. Now, you've seen Lewis formulas and energy level diagrams before. That was part of Science 10. We did it as part of the review, so we're kind of just seeing here it again. But now what we're going to do is try and relate it to why molecules bond. We're kind of on a journey here right now trying to figure out a little bit more about the molecules since Chemistry 10 was pretty much all about the ionic compounds. All right, so as we go through a couple of uh, things here, just remember that your chemical formulas are your formula units. They're there to give us the ratio. And we saw that uh, before with cations to anions, that neutral balanced ratio that we saw in ionic compounds. Your molecular formulas, however, don't have any ions. So our issue now here is that since we don't have any ions, uh, we have to indicate exactly how each of the bonded, uh, or pardon me, atoms are bonded to one another. All right, and so we kind of see a little bit of information here within the molecular formula, but it doesn't really tell us the overall arrangement. And so from there, we kind of look at what are known as structural formulas. So you're going to be drawing these molecules a little bit more to try and understand them. And you can see as we go from the molecular formula here to the structural formula, we see it's actually the carbons that are bonded together. This oxygen, which is hanging out, actually ended up being uh, bonded to one of the carbons to make the nail polish remover acetone that we're using as the example here. So we'll get into why this happens as we go through chapter three. Um, remember how we do bond, okay? There are two uh, different things. When we talked about ionic, okay, we were taking a look at the transfer of valence electrons from one to another. Covalent is different or molecular is uh, unique. As you recall, that's because we have a sharing of valence electrons. And so the, co uh, the valencies overlap and we get to this covalency or cooperative valency, otherwise known as a shared bit of electrons. So this is an entirely different mechanism that's going to take a little bit more work for us to understand. To do that then, uh, one of the first things we're going to do is just understand where the electrons are. And, <clears throat> pardon me, we did this in Chemistry 10. Trying to illustrate where the electrons are, we did it in two ways. One, we looked at energy level diagrams, which are much like these, in which what we did is we took a look at what was going on in the nucleus. We took a look at how many energy levels were involved. Remember that this is just your period number. All right, and periods, as we take a look at our periodic chart here, are the horizontal rows as you go across. All right, so something like nitrogen, for example, being in period two, would have two energy levels to hold all of its electrons. Okay, aluminum here is obviously in period three, so it's going to take three energy levels to hold all of its electrons. We're going to go one step further now, and we're going to take a look at kind of a hybrid now between energy level diagrams and Lewis dot, and we're going to take a look at the places in which the valence electrons are kind of housed or gathered. You can almost uh, consider in the octet rule the valence shell being kind of like four individual rooms. And the electrons are going to spread out into these individual rooms until they're forced to pair up to fill the rooms. Okay, These are known as your orbitals. And your orbitals, when we take a look at this one, each one has four orbitals. Each orbital can contain a maximum of two electrons, so we still have our octet rule for most of them. Your orbitals can be empty, they can be unfilled, as we see here with aluminum. It only has three valence electrons, so the fourth room it does not need any electrons. They can be half filled, like we see with a bunch of aluminum ones here, and a couple of the sulfur ones. All right, these are your bonding electrons, so they are available to be shared with other atoms or transferred in ionic compounds. And then we take a look at the ones here that are full, that have two. These are non-bonding, and these were your lone pairs that we remember from Lewis dot diagrams. 
So it's probably just easiest to kind of get back into this and look at some of the examples. All right, so what we're going to do is draw the energy level diagrams here for our um, uh, various elements that were being shown. The first one here is hydrogen. So we go and we take a look at our periodic chart and we find out that hydrogen is in period one. It has an atomic mass of one and it has an atomic number of one. We should recall at this point that atomic number is the count of protons. Atomic mass is the sum total of protons and neutrons. And this energy level of one tells us that it's going to take one uh, energy level to hold all of the base electrons. And one other thing that your teacher may have talked about, I know I did in the review, is these A groupings. All right, this is in group 1A. This tells us the number of valence electrons in the neutral atom. So this gives us everything we need to know about hydrogen. All right, so for our energy level diagram, we would show the number of protons. That's equal to 1. You can put the symbol as we evolve this a little bit more. And then, of course, we have just the one energy level that had just one electron in it. All right. Back in uh, Science 10, we worked a little bit harder in having you guys work with the nucleus, and so sometimes we drew the nucleus there. Um, we're not working with isotopes so much here as we move through the remainder of chemistry, so that information is being dropped as we evolve this theory. All right. What are we looking at as we evolve the theory then? If we take a look at fluorine, again, we'll go to our periodic chart here. Whoops, kind of reflective there. All right, and so there's your fluorine. You can see that it's in group 7A, which means it has seven valence electrons. It's in period two, which means it's going to take two energy levels to hold uh, all of those electrons. And it has nine protons in its nucleus. So as we go to draw that one, all right, you've got fluorine and the protons equal to nine. We said that it's going to take two energy levels to hold all of the electrons. Now, as we recall, the first energy level is the smallest, all right? It is the smallest of all the rooms, can only hold a maximum of two. It is the remaining energy levels that follow that octet rule that can hold up to a maximum of eight. Fluorine is an atom. It's in group 7A, all right? Or we can take a look at the number of protons. It's got to equal protons for electrons for a neutral atom. So I've used two of nine, and so seven electrons would have to fit up here. Here's the different part. We want to try and show what would be in each of those four orbital rooms. And so we populate them individually. I would have one, two, three, four, and then I still got seven, so I'd have to pair up five, six, seven. So the first three rooms will have two electrons each. They will be non-bonding and full, and then we will see just one electron here, and so fluorine can form one bond, either ionically or share it covalently. Okay, we'll get through uh, one more example here. Taking a look at phosphorus. All right, we find phosphorus on our sheet. You can see phosphorus is in group three, sits here at position 15, so 15 protons and 15 electrons for the neutral atom. And so our symbol for phosphorus is P. We would have 15 protons, as we find that with the atomic number. It was in period three, so I know I'm going to need one, two, three energy levels to hold all of the electrons. So since this is by name the neutral atom, protons must equal electrons, and so therefore I would put two of my 15 here, I would put eight of my 15 here, and then I can have up to eight in the next energy level. I've used 10 of 15, so there's only five remaining. How do those populate into those orbitals? One, two, three, four. All right, I would have one, two, three, four electrons. I have five to put in, so one of the rooms must double up. And so I should see two electrons, one electron, one electron, and one electron. Okay, I hope that makes some sense for you. Uh, in the next video, I will get into the Lewis dot diagrams and finish that off, and then we'll get into some electronegativity.